Welcome to Coast View, the show that every single day celebrates the men and women who are making coastal Mississippi such a great place to live, work, and play. Today, we're going to be talking with Jeff Duncan, and uh, I'm also going to pull uh, Kyle into the conversation here in just a few seconds. We're going to talk about, among other things, clutter. You'll have to hang in there with us, and we'll uh, we'll, we'll tell you what I'm talking about. I wanted to t- <clears throat> bring your attention to a couple of shows that I've done in the in the past week that have been just terrific and have gotten some steam on on the internet. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a little frog in my throat this morning. One one that I really enjoy doing is with a former former drummer friend of mine. We we drummed uh, in high school together. And, uh, you know, once a drummer, always a drummer. I, I played a little bit in a country music band not long after I, after I left high school. But Greg Fierris went on to Mississippi State. He went on to be a composer. Uh, he wrote dr- writes drum lines. Uh, I mean, he's extraordinarily talented. And we, uh, we told his story. And we told, uh, you know, we shared four of his songs that are being played across the United States today anywhere from high school to college. And uh, it's just an exciting story. I enjoy, Greg's such a humble guy. I described him in high school as being literally the shyest guy I knew. And and while we were together in high school, he was already reading about music composition and doing all this cool stuff. I didn't even know he was doing it. I mean, this guy, it's just so remarkable to have this show coach you, to be able to go back and reflect on friendships like with Greg, to see what they've done with their lives and how they're touching so many uh, young people across the nation with incredible music, just just awesome. I had an awesome conversation with a with a former journalism friend of mine, Jim Asher. Jim was the head of the Knight Ritter in McClatchy, uh, Washington bureau. He actually came to the Sun Herald with a with a number of other people from Knight Ritter after Hurricane Katrina. So he 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 actually uh, worked with us and worked with our journalistic team here in coastal Mississippi after Katrina. Got to know a lot of the people here. And all of us have kept a really good, close relationship with Jim throughout. He's retired now. He's working on a book. Uh, but, man, does he have some incredible stories to tell about his t- time in Washington as the head of the Washington Bureau. And one of the things that we talked about is the rise of nonprofits around the country, actually, that are funded by funders with political aspirations or at least political agendas. And that's that's a, that's a, that's a troubling, a very troubling trend and um, I'm actually in the process of writing about it now. But I, I, I called those kind of journalism organizations. They call themselves journalism, but they're really are more nothing more than than stooges that are shilling for some rich people with an agenda. And that kind of journalism is not journalism at all. And we had a deep conversation about it. And I think if you have any interest in journalism <clears throat> or some of these trends, <clears throat> you'll uh, go go take a listen to that one. And, uh, you know, and then lastly, I had a conversation. I circled back with my friend <clears throat> Ted Jackson, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist who I worked with at, at Nor- New, in New Orleans at the Times Picayune dot com. He's from Mississippi. We told, spent an entire show talking about his story. Just a great story coming from Mississippi to become this incredible photojournalism, uh, photojournalist. And he wrote a great book. <clears throat> and this week we visited about the book. And the way I describe Ted is Ted is a photojournalist with a heart. And um, I didn't know at the time that we recorded the show that it was actually going to play on Ash Wednesday. And a friend of mine pointed out that it was the perfect, perfect show for Ash Wednesday. It was a, it was a, a story about humanity. If you missed that, I would really encourage you to go take a look at it. Anyway, so many other shows and so much to talk about. But before we go any further, let me bring my friend Jeff Duncan and the producer of Coast View, my friend Kyle Curley, into the conversation and just say good morning to both of you. How you doing? I'm doing great. Ricky, Kyle, good to talk to you all. Always good to visit uh, here on a beautiful Thursday over <laughs> in New Orleans. Yeah, for sure. Hey, Kyle, you know, of course, uh, we'll come to Jeff next, but Jeff had the opportunity to work with, with Ted Jackson in New Orleans, so he knows him extremely well. But um, that that was a special show we did with him, wasn't it, buddy? It really was. Uh, you know, that's one of those conversations that you listen to and you watch and you get drawn into it and you don't realize how much time has passed and – it seems like it went by in five or ten minutes, but yet it was what forty-two minutes total content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know that those are the conversations that I really like that draw you in, and 
I guess it was the journalistic part too, because he's always drawn you to stick around because there's always more. I mean, yeah. He leaves you yeah. to more, and it was a great positive show, especially for the day that it aired. Yes. Well, what one of the things, one of the major messages that came out of that is that why I call Ted a photojournalist with a heart is that he, as he passed people on the street, let's say homeless people on the street, Ted's not the guy that would pass them by. I think too many of us just want to move on past the situation, but Ted will make eye contact and and befriend these people and begin to sort of capture their moment. And he he believes that everyone needs a voice, and he really dedicated his life to that. And and there's a lesson in that for all of us. There's a, there's an incredible lesson in that, in that for all of us. And one of the one of the points that he makes is that who's our one? We may not be able to save the world, but maybe maybe there's one person we can help save. Who is that one person that we want to save? And that was powerful, wasn't it, man? Yeah, it really was. And you know, I. I kind of see that in, around town as well, that, you know, there's certain areas that there's going to be a a fewer more of homeless people. And, you know, there's a lot of people that just skip on by and there's, you know, I've talked to a few of them just here and there at the gas station or wherever. And they're really nice people. They're just caught in bad situations and for the most part can't find a way to get out of it. Yeah, it was a, it was, it was a, it was a wonderful conversation about humanity again. And, uh, and coming to my friend, Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the times Picayune, buddy, nothing at all surprises you about this conversation about Ted, does it? No, you know, I can remember a story Ted's told uh, during our coverage of Hurricane Katrina, where he was out and this is in the initial days in New Orleans when the floodwaters were really high all over the city. And he ended up winning, you know, of course, of course, won a Pulitzer Prize on the team that we all did that, that covered the storm. But Ted was shooting some of the rescue, search and rescue missions, of course, during those early days. And he came, he was out in his own, uh, like, flat bottom boat that he had brought to the uh, Times Picayune, was rowing around, shooting photos. And he came upon a, a, a young family on a rooftop and he had his camera out and was shooting them. And he said he realized looking in their eyes through the lens, they were kind of giving him this look like, what are you doing? We're up here trying to be, uh, you know, we're trying to get saved. And he realized he needed to put his camera down and row over and save them. And he did. Uh, and that speaks to Ted Jackson, right? I mean, he realized it, humanity first, photojournalism second. But that's a lot of the conflict that we are all put in into that kind of uh, world where you're trying to where you're trying to document history. It's our job, but yet you're also a human being first. And, and I thought he put that very eloquently when he's talked about it. Special dude, man. Special dude. Hey, I mentioned we were going to talk about clutter. Um, I, we've been in the process of moving from one farm to another farm, and uh, at least three separate farms up in the Mississippi Delta, and. We're giving one of them up and, and moving to a different farm, and that's where our house is located. And, it, you know, I was telling Kyle before the show started that we've been in it for six years, and it's amazing to me how much clutter piles up. And we were sharing some sto war stories about clutter. My wife is a clutter freak, man. If, if she looks in the corner and it's not totally organized, then she's, she's going to start ripping and tearing. And the first thing that happens is that a – a garbage can gets near over there. And if I'm not looking over his shoulder, the stuff that goes in that garbage can, it's it's hard for me to let that stuff go. But man, that's just the way she is. And Kyle was, you know, he's been doing some spring cleaning of his own. You tell 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 what you said uh just a few minutes ago. I had so many uh trips back and forth where we've been just cleaning stuff out and hauling it off to Goodwill. And my neighbor had noticed how many vehicles have come and gone with just loaded up of stuff and he come over and asked me he goes are you moving too i'm like no i'm not <laughs> just getting rid of a lot of stuff <laughs> so apparently uh, a good bit of clutter <laughs> yeah i mean listen you know if there was a you know the the the, the notion of of managing clutter it, it cuts across all social, economic, political boundaries, man. It's the one common thing we all share. We all work to fight it. Isn't that true, Jeff? Yeah, look, early in my journalism career, you know, and you can appreciate this, Ricky, 
you have to move a lot when you're young. Uh, you kind of skip around from job to job. It's kind of part of paying your dues. So I learned quickly as I moved, I think I moved like six times in the first 10 years of my career. And I learned quickly, man, I cannot collect clutter because it's going to make moving so much more difficult. So once I got settled here in New Orleans, after like two decades, I finally moved. And uh, I realized I had not learned that lesson since I moved to New Orleans. <laughs> and my friend at the time had told me, you, you need to have a rule, hard, fast rule. If you haven't worn it or used it in the last year, you probably don't need it unless it's something that's like a, an archival piece from your family or something like that. Uh, you can probably go without it. So I've tried to adhere to that. I've not been very successful, but it does help, uh, you know, cut down on the clutter. Hey, for the radio audience, they, they for people on Facebook or YouTube, they can see this. But behind you, I see bookshelves full of books. That includes books, man, holding on to books. It's hard to let go of them, isn't it? Yeah, like I've got tons more in my back study. Uh, yeah, but it's something I'm always going to have. Matter of fact, I'm working on getting some built-in bookcases because I do not want hardcover books to go away. I know we're in a digital world, but I think there's always going to be a place for those. I'm the same way, man. I got I got books all over this table. Um, Faulkner and Hemingway and um, Jeff Duncan, yeah, <laughs> Jeff Duncan, <laughs> Peyton Breeze. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, books are hard to let go of, and what we end up doing, unfortunately, because we just don't have room for all of them, we end up putting them in some some you know sealed boxes and, and yep. putting them on a shelf somewhere. And Ann says, just just let them go. Just just no, I can't. I can't let go of books. It's just so hard to do that. Uh, anyway, Cal, listen, we Jeff and I appreciate you being with us every Friday. We should visit with you more. And uh, we're lucky to have Jeff, aren't we, my friend? We are very uh, knowledgeable uh, asset, I would say, and a uh, good friend of the show, a good friend to us. Yeah, there's no, there's no doubt about it. Th thank you, buddy. It's been great to, to say good morning to you uh, this morning, yep. Kyle. 30 seconds. So, Jeff, Jeff, coming back to you, man, you've been, you know, we'll we'll find out the latest. I mean, the news actually coming out of the Saints outside of, uh, you know, some, some <clears throat> you know, Calvin Throckmorton signing a one-year deal and stuff like that. Of course, uh, a lot of, lot of things surging around Alvin Kamara and, uh, and the coaching situation, et cetera. There's been a lot, not a lot of news coming out of the Saints. And also the Pelicans, were, we've been in the all-star break. <clears throat> we're all wondering how they're going to get their offense back. I'd be curious to get your point of view about that. But before we – I tell you what, we're at the end of the segment. When we get on the other side, I just want to get your impression about Tiger Woods coming back into the PGA and <clears throat> what that means. He, you know, in spite of the fact – he he didn't hit a low score. His golf swing looked good. His, his swing, you know, a lot of the analysts said, you know what, if he keeps this up, he might be in the mix this year, which is incredibly surprising. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Times Picking. Welcome back to Coast View. We're visiting with my friend Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Times Picking. And, and for those of you who don't know Jeff, obviously he covers the Saints. He's uh, on the NFL Hall of Fame selection committee. He's, you know, won about every award you can possibly win. Um, he's covered LSU along the way. He'll write about LSU from time to time. He uh, enjoys sort of watching the PGA. He's kind of a horse racing aficionado. You know, he's a he's your typical smart uh, sports guy. He, he really sort of wants to dabble in lots of different things, but he's the ultimate insider as it relates to the Saints. But when we went to break, we're talking about the PGA just a little bit, and uh, there's there's two things I want to I want to ask Jeff about. But first is about Tiger Woods, and sort of you know w watching even some of his harshest critics evaluate his swing and say, man, he looked pretty good this past weekend. And uh, you know it's important to the game to see Tiger Woods' name out there, isn't it? Yeah, look, there's certain athletes, Ricky, that transcend sports. I mean, very few of them, but Tiger Woods is definitely one of them. I mean, you don't have to be a golf fan to know who Tiger Woods is. I mean, he really took the sport by storm, raised it to a whole nother level. And that's why you see really the universal respect from his peers and people in the industry and in, in the golf world. Uh, they understand that he is one of the greatest uh, golfers in the history of the game. And, and in the modern era, which become very, become so competitive, so much money involved, a lot of that is attributed to Tiger Woods and, and, and the ratings we see in golf that have stayed high 
uh, despite you know the kind of the stratification of of, of global media. Uh, that in part is due to Tiger Woods because he opened up the game to a whole different audience. And so I think it's fun to watch whether he wins or not. Just fun to watch someone overcome adversity and pursue their passion in life. And you can appreciate that whether you're a golf fan or not. Yeah, you know, I play golf about every two or three years to remind myself why I don't play. So I'm 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 literally that target audience, the the, the non golfer that when Tiger's in the mix, I want to watch. I like when he's at the Masters, I'm not missing a stroke. If they, I'm, I'm watching it on social media. I'm following him along with that with the dedicated crew. I'm watching it on TV. I, I just love watching it. And when and when he's not involved, you know, there aren't that many personalities there that make it fun to kind of come into the game. Some of the young guys are, are coming along. Um, but when you look at, you know, you, you have a way of looking at someone's, uh, you know, staying power looking at their, at their swing. When you evaluate sort of ha- how he played this past uh, week, do you see signs that he actually could be competitive? Oh yeah. There's no doubt about it. I mean, this was just him getting started again. So he's only going to continue, you know, the, the thing that separates great athletes like Tiger Woods and Drew Brees, guys I've covered, is that drive to be great. And he has it. There's no question. That competitive drive, there's no doubt in my mind he's going to get back and you know become a top 10 competitor. Now, whether he can continue to win at that level, I think it, even at his age, considering what he's had to overcome, I think it's going to be difficult because of the competitive level. But there's no doubt watching him this past week, uh, I saw a tremendous improvement from where he was a year ago. Yeah, man, it's uh, it's, uh, it's something to watch. Have you seen the new Netflix series on on golf? Where I've it not, these but, you know, they were here last year filming that at the Zurich Classic. So I met some of the producers, some of the videographers who were here, and I was really looking forward to watching. I just haven't had time to watch it, but I know – it's getting rave reviews early on. Well, what's so interesting about it? First of all, my son Jordan uh, said that the PGA should work harder to sort of humanize the golfers. So a lot of behind the scenes stuff, sort of like the Formula One uh, kind of thing. You know, what 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 the Netflix series did for Formula One is undeniable. We now know who these drivers were before we didn't really know who they were. And it's literally the same mold. It's almost as if the same producers who did the Formula One piece are the ones who have done this PGA piece. But what makes it so fascinating is not only are you digging deep into sort of the behind the scenes stories of of these chosen players that are featured in this in this series, but Live Golf comes comes to fruition while they're doing it. I don't think they realized at the time that this would be sort of this incredible thing that they were going to be able to see behind the scenes. And you get a, you get a chance to see what was going through some of these guys' mind as they considered where they were going to play in that first tournament. And then ultimately they signed up and, and so on, but uh, they pull no punches. They, they share the story uh, in just about every angle you could possibly see it. And uh, it gives, uh, it gives a lot of insights into Live golf in general, but where do, where where do you see that scenario as we speak today? The PGA sort of versus live golf, and where do you think this is headed? Well, look, I think we've already seen the impact it's had on the PGA. You're seeing purses uh, rise dramatically on the PGA Tour. You know, competition does that, and and they now have competition. I mean, for years, decades, the PGA Tour pretty much had a monopoly at the top of the sport. So now, live golf. For better or worse, is at least I think had an impact on some of the purses, and it's going to be interesting to see how some of these uh, you know title sponsors like Zurich here in New Orleans how they respond uh, you know as well because you know it's only going to drive up I think the price the purses for the players here on the on the tour, but I think it's still going to be a continuing battle for Liv to secure enough top players to be a one on one battle with. The PGA Tour. There's just too many traditionalists in the sport that I think understand what the PGA Tour has done for their careers and want to stick by them. Well, you you see in that series, the good news is that the 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 majority of the young players, the stars, have stayed with the PGA. Thank goodness. And um, and some of the some of the guys who decided to move into the live, you you actually got to see where they were in their careers. 
and they, some were struggling. Some were really worried about where that next paycheck was going to come from. And then Liv shows up, and it's clear they made decisions based on the money and what was best for their family. You certainly certainly can't blame them. But um, but you know the the thing that bothers me about the whole situation, Jeff, is that. The, the the creation of Live Golf is not about creating a business model that is going to be viable. It's you know it's being completely funded by uh, Saudis, and uh, there clear there seems to be a clear mission around it that's more marketing related than it is about you know building something that's going to be sustainable. The only way it's going to be sustainable is they continue to pour hundreds of, of millions of dollars into this, and uh, and we all understand you know as journalists we understand. Um, the whole issue around the journalist that was killed, and uh, it's just hard to stomach it. Still, you know, I, you know, sometimes you know, Machiavelli says we have short memories, but this is one that's not easy to have a short memory about. Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, difficult for them to overcome a lot of that in the end. Even as much money as is behind it, uh, eventually it's going to come down to the star power of the of the talent, and if they cannot attract enough. I think it's going to be uh, short-lived, but we'll see. You know, there's a lot of money behind it, deep pockets, as deep as it gets in this whole world. So, uh, but, you know, you see what happens. You mentioned about some of the players that are going there. You, you see that happen here in, in America with even, like, some of these uh, sports, like the uh, leagues, like the USFL and the XFL. They're getting former coaches from the NFL, former uh, NFL players, that are maybe at the end of their careers and they're still going to try and get a last paycheck. I mean, it goes on in all sports the same way. Uh, I know right now a lot of former Saints coaches that I covered on the Super Bowl team, Greg McMahon, uh, you know, Jim Hazlitt, the first uh, head coach I covered here, they're coaching in that sport because they can make money there uh, late in their careers and still kind of get their competitive juices uh, flowing. Yeah, it's, it's it's completely understandable, you know. And again, you in this Netflix series, you you get a chance to see what was going through their minds, you know. And 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 in most cases, man, it was the money talked. I mean, the yeah. bottom line was, it was so much money, it was hard to hard to to walk away from it. And you know, guys that were sort of in the prime of their career, um, they could overlook all these other swirling political issues and just and just focus on what does it mean for them and their family and and they they pointed out they run a business and you know this is uh this is hard to pass up especially when you consider where they were at that at that point in their careers um so we'll shift gears but it's it's really interesting to watch the PGA we can talk more about that in the future just because it's uh, you know with competition it does it does it does cause you to kind of step up your game and the PGA is going to do that as well, and uh, I think this Netflix series might be the beginning of a lot just like it you know where we're getting to know these players better where we're wanting you know making a connection between the average even non golfer and the PGA and and some have awesome personalities you just don't see it when they're out there. On the uh, on the field, my, my my son Jordan calls many of them Rain Man. You know the way the way they play the game. You just it's just stoic, and you don't get to see their personalities. I, of course, some of them you get to, but just it's just an interesting story. So you saw how I characterized where we were in the season as it relates to the Saints. But it's a quiet time, but there's still some important things going on, Arthur Jeff. Well, it'll, it'll ramp up big time this weekend. I mean, Sunday is the start of the NFL scouting combine. That's really kind of the official kickoff of the draft period. Uh, you know, the Saints coaches basically were off all this last week, uh, getting some downtime because once the draft process heats up, they're going to be flying all over the country evaluating prospects. Uh, the scouts are heavily involved already. So, yeah, we're, we're going to – It's news will start coming out as the Saints get ready – for the start of free agency, it's going to be a busy free agency period. When we come back, we'll get a we'll get Jeff's take on the quarterback carousel that he says needs to come to an end, and we'll talk about something we've talked about many times on this show. What are the Saints doing currently to get the salary cap challenges behind them so they can go and get a really good quarterback? We'll see you after this. Welcome back to Coast View. We're visiting with my friend Jeff Duncan, and uh, we're talking about the Saints as we speak. And, uh, of course, Jeff has previously written, and I think we discussed to some extent last week, this it's time for the Saints to end the the coaching carousel, excuse me, the quarterback carousel. 
there there's a there's a big reality around that and we've we've all learned as as um as as, as enthusiasts of the game that in order to win in this game you got to have you got to have a, a, a world class quarterback and so what's your latest thinking you know Derek Carr has been to New York Jets and you know are there other teams interested what's your your latest thinking well look i think the the Derek Carr situation is fascinating uh, we we have now seen that he went to the Jets and it sounded like there was a lot of mutual interest there he's got a lot of connections to the Jets but the Jets seem to be waiting on Aaron Rodgers which i think's somewhat interesting as well uh, why, if you think Derek Carr is the answer, why you wouldn't go ahead and take it? Because Derek, uh, one thing we've learned, the Aaron Rodgers situation is hard to read, right? And uh, so I think the Saints are in a good position with Derek Carr, but I really believe the Jets are the biggest competitor and maybe in the lead right now. So I'm sure they have a plan B, uh, but what that plan B is, I'm sure it involves probably multiple options, including a veteran quarterback, maybe you know someone in the market like a Jimmy Garoppolo, that could be an upgrade over what they had. But at the same time, I think they might turn their attention to the draft for the first time in a long time and maybe draft a young quarterback as well and have that understudy, uh, you know, sitting on the bench, developing while the veteran bridge quarterback uh, kind of guides this roster. Because right now, Ricky, this roster is, is a mature roster. I mean, it's ready to win right now. They're not rebuilding in New Orleans with stars like, Alvin Kamara and DeMario Davis and Cam Jordan on the roster. They're trying to win now. So it makes sense, uh, you know, in the in the life cycle of this roster to bring in a veteran guy. And if you do draft one, have him be sort of the Pat Mahomes situation where he sits and develops for a year or so before you bring him on. So when you compare Garoppolo with Carr, what how does that how does that that mesh out for you? Well, I, I'm a big Jimmy Garoppolo fan. I, I actually think Jimmy Garoppolo is very underrated. The problem is he's had a bunch of injuries. I don't know if you call it injury prone. I don't like to use that. It makes it out like you're vulnerable. I mean, it's just a tough position to play, and you get hit a lot. And he hasn't played early in his career behind great offensive lines. So uh, he's just a winner. I mean, I, it, it opened my eyes during the Super Bowl when Joe Montana came out and said if he were the 49ers, that's who he would start over Brock Purdy and Trey Lance. Uh, you know, you go with the guy that wins games. So that, and Jim, and I know that uh, Sean Payton was a huge fan. Obviously, Bill Belichick was a big fan. Uh, those are some pretty guys with some pretty good pedigrees. I think they know what they're doing. There's a reason this 49ers traded for him as well. So uh, I like him. Uh, Derek Carr has been much more durable, much more reliable during his career. But I think either one of those guys would be an upgrade over what the Saints have had in the last two years. I think I think you're right. I'm a, I'm a Garoppolo fan myself, um, although I can see where Derek Carr would also be just a, a, a significant uh, improvement over what we have now, that's for sure. Listen, NOLA.com and the times Picayune posted the video of um, the alleged scenario around Alvin Kamara and from Las Vegas, a couple of different angles. Um, if you haven't seen it, you can go to nodal.com and take a look at it. But um, man, that's troubling to, to watch. Yeah, it's obviously, you knew that was going to come out eventually. It's part of the evidence that's going to be in, in the trial. And um, I think, look, I think at some point the NFL is going to weigh in. They usually, their protocol is to uh, allow the, the criminal proceedings to take place first before they, and it makes sense, right? I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to discipline someone without knowing exactly how, how harsh the crime is. So I think they want to get all the facts first, but I think there's no question after getting a year of leniency from the league, something is going to happen this year with Alvin Kamara and the Saints are, I'm sure, have taken all that into account and understand that running back is going to have to be a top priority. Really have no other running backs on the roster of of any consequence. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they drafted one very high, maybe even brought in another one in free agency just to have insurance in case the likely discipline comes down for Alvin Kamara. It could be, it could be minimum, it probably is going to be a minimum six games, but it could be well more than that when you consider how bad this looks. It's not just the crime itself. It's also the optics of it that, that the league takes into account. And that did not look good at all for Alvin Kamara. 
And we have a we have a, a DA in Las Vegas who is seems to, at this point in the, in the juncture to not be impressed with his celebrity. They are it's it's uh, brass tacks focused on doing what is right by the law, and he's not letting up. That's kind of where we are with him, isn't it? Well, it's no different in a way than say New Orleans and stuff that happens during uh, you know major tourist events. Uh, that's part of the business of Las Vegas. It's part of the business of New Orleans tourism. And so they are going to crack down on these things because they do not want uh, the image of Las Vegas to be tarnished for a tourism or a tourist destination market. So when you see things like that, of course, it gives you pause about coming there. So they, they are very strict on those kind of things. I've heard that for years. Do not want to get in trouble in Las Vegas. And that's what Alvin Kamara is faced with, even with his celebrity involved. Sometimes that actually works against you because that case is getting way more eyeballs on it than would it be me or you involved. Unreal. Um, I haven't seen any reporting about this, but but what are you hearing behind the scenes about what the Saints are doing to deal with the salary cap situation? Well, they're already making a bunch of uh, restructures on contracts. This was to be expected. They've uh, restructured Will Lutz and Eric McCoy. Uh, I know they're, they're basically maneuvering to get under the salary cap for the start of free agency. So they're able to be active participants and not only sign new free agents, but also they want to re- re-sign some of their existing free agents. Guys off the top of my head like uh, Caden Ellis and Carl Granderson that kind of had breakout years last year. I know they're interested in bringing back Marcus Davenport. Uh, what kind of market's he going to have? He's going to demand – probably a lot of money as a pass rushing defensive end. It's an elite position. So they have to have money to operate, not to mention the quarterback situation that we were talking about earlier. So they have to get back under the cap. Uh, so th- this is where the things have changed for the Saints. I've, I've written about this a bunch of times, Ricky. Back when I first started covering the team, Rick uh, Randy Mueller was the general manager, and he used to tell me that the team did not have the cash flow to do these kind of restructures. When you restructure the way the Saints do these accounting moves, uh, they have to have cash on hand because they're moving money from 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 the, the salary, the base salary they earn, into a signing bonus where the player gets the cash immediately up front. And that's a win for the player because you got the money in the bank. You don't have to wait on it, right? We all know that. It's basic economics. Well, to do that, you have to have the cash on hand. Saints never did back in the early days. They are so... Uh, you know, rich with cash right now, they're able to do these things all the time. It really shows you how healthy the organization is. And it's one of the reasons why they've been very competitive in the last 15 years. When they redid the deal with the state of Louisiana, it gave them such a formidable advantage over their small market peers. This, This is one of the best deals in sports. And it's important because the Saints now can act like a big market team as opposed to being in the second smallest market in the NFL. You always wonder, you know, you have this great deal with the state and all this money, you know, coming into the Saints organization, but then they turn around and give a lot of money back to the community, which is no, notable and important. But at what point is that money they're giving back to the community from the state? <laughs> I don't I don't know the answer to all those questions, but they clearly are financially successful, and uh, and hopefully they'll continue to be financially successful, so they can get, keep these get these deals done. And they are super, super, super creative, man. They've shown their ability to do that over and over and over again, and uh, that's important. Do you, do you hear any rumors as we come into the end of this segment? Do you hear any rumors of of players we're probably going to lose? Well, I think it's going to be difficult to keep guys like Marcus Davenport. I mean, he's playing a prime position. The Saints will probably treat him like they did Trey Hendrickson and Marcus Williams, who left uh, Teron Armstead. In other words, they want them back. They will tell them, we're going to make you an offer, but you're free to go out into the market and see what your market value is. If you want to come back to us, we'll certainly try to be competitive. But that's the way Mickey Loomis has operated in the past. And I think – Davenport, who I know a lot of fans have been frustrated with because his production hasn't matched the expectations. I get it. Uh, but these big guys, these big defensive linemen, I've learned sometimes you have to be patient with them. They're like a year away from breaking out, and uh, you sometimes have to pay for potential. And uh, I think that's going to be an interesting case because Marcus Davenport 
look, Ryan Nielsen just left the old defensive line coach to be the defensive coordinator in Atlanta. He's very familiar with Marcus Davenport. The Falcons have a lot of money, Ricky, to spend, a lot more than the Saints have, and they need a pass rusher. So it just makes sense to me to see him potentially end up in Atlanta. So interesting. Uh, so interesting. <clears throat> there's a, there's always a lot to think about during the off season. And this one is going to be really dynamic. Um, hey, listen, uh, when we come back with Jeff Duncan on the other side, we'll talk about the latest on the Pelicans started out the season, man, they, they, they look like they were going to be the dream team. And then all of those injuries, it's incredible. If they could get all their stars on the court at the same time, they would be a really, really good team. We'll, we'll uh, hear what Jeff's thoughts are about that on the other side. We'll see you after this break. Welcome back to Coast View. It's Friday here on Coast View, so we have Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. And it's always great to sort of tapping into his mind to see what's going on behind the scenes in New Orleans as it relates to professional sports. You know, as it relates to the Pelicans, you heard what I said going into the break. You know, if they could get all their stars on the on the court at the same time, they would be a really, really good team. And this has been a tough year and from an injury point of view. Uh they they've been far from getting all of their stars on the on the court at the same time. Uh and now it looks like Zion Zion's gonna be out you know a, you know some extended period of time. Here we are in the all star break. What do you th- what's what's the likelihood that the Saints are going to make it to the playoffs? What's your what's your latest? Excuse me, the Pelicans. What's the, what's your latest thinking? Well, they got to get the band back together again, Ricky. I mean, it's like they're playing without Lennon and McCartney, or something. you know, they got they've got to get these guys healthy. They don't have a lot of time. I mean, one thing that I think is interesting: a lot of casual fans in sports they think, oh, the All Star break we're halfway through the season. No, the NBA All Star break is basically over three quarters of the way through the season. There's only like 25 games left. So there's not a lot of time to make up ground. And they've lost so much ground because of these injuries to the stars. Zion Williamson, Brandon Ingram's back now. They're getting some other uh, key role players and bench players back in the rotation. Uh, they've got to tread water until Zion gets back on the court. How effective he's going to be when he does come back. What kind of basketball shape he's going to be in, I think is a big question. But I think they can still make the playoffs. It's not going to be easy. It's getting more competitive in the West. The trade deadline didn't help matters because teams like Phoenix were bringing on stars like Kevin Durant. The Lakers made a big deal. They got better. So it's. I think it's going to be a long shot for them to be where they were maybe a few months ago. We were thinking, oh, they might be a top four team in the West. I think that's kind of a long shot now because of the setbacks with the injuries. Yeah, at one point they were leading. <laughs> yes, it's just so yep. interesting to see what happened to this team. But gosh, they were on a roll. And you see, you know, of course, Brandon Ingram comes back. I think in his most recent game, if I remember this correctly, he he, sh- he shot thirty four points. And just a reminder of really how dominant he can be when he's when he's in there and he's healthy. Um, boy, you know, if you could if you could get Brandon Ingram. And Zion Williamson, both healthy, both on the field, with his with his cast of young players around him, man, they could be. This could be really a good team. Yeah, teams have figured out how to defend them when only one of those stars is out there. They're they're in the bottom five right now. I think my colleague Christian Clark reported that this week. Bottom five to ten offenses in the league now, uh, and that was they were one of the top offenses before all these injuries occurred. But when they only have one star out there, and I know C.J. McCollum helps, he's definitely still a, a threat offensively, but they're much easier to defend. And uh, look, they together, I've, I've mentioned this to you before, since Willie Green took over as a head coach, which is now toward the end of his second season, Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson have played 12 games together. I mean, that's insane. We're look, coming up here on 164 games, and they've only played 12 of those together. Uh, it's hard to win when you don't have your stars in that league. Yeah, it it, re- it really is. It really is. And and remind remind people real quick that for those who haven't paid attention, for New Orleans to be a small market team and to have the stars it has, if they were healthy, you know they've done a pretty good job of building the ability to win, haven't they? Yeah, they built a great culture. <clears throat> That's one of the things that David Griffin wanted to do. He saw how successful it was for the Saints right across the parking lot out in Kenner. Uh, at the same facility uh, where the Saints with Drew Brees and Sean Payton made it a destination 
uh, club. I mean, players wanted to play in New Orleans. They never did that before. When I when I covered the team, the Saints always had to overpay to get top free agents to come here to compensate because of the small market. They're getting to that point here in New Orleans with the Pelicans, but they just keep getting sidetracked by these injuries. But I think the culture is in place, and it's much more difficult in the NBA to overcome the small market. A good example, the, the Pelicans – a local TV deal that they have right now is very much in jeopardy because of Bally Sports and Sinclair Broadcasting, who owns them. I mean, they are uh, filed for bankruptcy. That's part of the main way that NBA teams get their revenue streams. And even when the Pelicans are doing well, they get maybe $35 million a year annually. I know that sounds like a lot of money, but compared to their peers, like in Los Angeles and Golden State, they're getting deals $170 million. And there's no way to make that up in the revenue streams in the NBA. So they're just at a decided disadvantage revenue-wise against some of their peers. So for where the Pelicans are, to be able to overcome that, they have to have everybody healthy and, and, and make it work through the draft. They're not really going to be in the market to bring in these huge free agents with these major contracts in the NBA. Yeah, it's just such an imbalance, whereas the NFL has done a great job of creating parity and making it so that small market teams like New Orleans can, can survive. And, you know, the other thing, just, just, as, a, just as a viewer of, of the NBA, and again, I'm, I'm not much on the NBA except for it's been fun watching the Pelicans. It's, it's hard to find them on the TV, to be honest with you. It's, a, it's not, a, not, a, not a game that you're going to find regularly here in coastal Mississippi. So we did, we're not finding that connection with the team. So they've got some challenges as it relates to that. Listen, uh, Justin, great to catch up with you, my friend. When we come back next week, I'll get the latest on your books that you're writing with Steve Gleason. What a great experience that's been for you. What a life-changing experience that's been for you. And I can't wait to read it. It's going to be one of those books, I think, that's going to take America by storm. And we'll talk more about that next week. All right. Have a great weekend, everybody. Have a great weekend, Ricky Kyle. See you next week. You bet. You bet. Have a great weekend, and we will see you Monday.